So how do we use these things, or where might you use these things? Um, this is all about risk assessment, right? So we're going to look at two different applications. One of them is uh, at a line of business level, how do we assess things? So, and the second will be back to reinsurance structures. So the, the first uh, line of business setting, so you're going to imagine yourself having, you know, created these, uh, the loss distribution, done your analysis there, you've, cr you've come up with a distortion function to measure your spectral risk measure, to calculate it, and now somebody hands you the, you know, the plan for, for next underwriting year, and they say, line of business one has a plan loss ratio of 85%, line of business two is 65%, take an average of those, uh, come up with the portfolio results. So if you were handed just this loss ratio, and again, we've taken these losses to be kind of given to us uh, as the truth. So you imagine that the, you know, whoever's doing the planning agrees with you on what the loss distribution looks like. We can back in to our actual premium or the planned premium by dividing out that uh, loss ratio. And then we can say, again, we agree on the losses. So by subtracting expected losses from the expected premium, we get expected profit. Up here, we're doing calculations based off of our distortion function and our, our um, spectral risk measure. We are basically just relabeling here. The required premium just points to distorted expectation. And we're saying, this is your losses plus your profit load. Um, and I don't think we've mentioned it, but everything here is kind of in the view of net of expenses. Uh, so we're looking at pure loss plus the profit. Our expenses are kind of separate conversation. Um, but we've got our required premium. We know what the losses are. So this is the required loss ratio we need to write this at, given our kind of taste of risk and our risk preference that's built into that distortion function. Um, as a result, we get required profit. So we can kind of align these two things and ask ourselves questions like, Based on this plan, are we charging enough premium? Are we receiving enough premium as a firm, given that we've specified our risk preferences within this distortion function? Are we getting enough premium to support this risk, the way we're viewing it and quantifying it? So if we're uh, expecting a profit of 62.5 and we're requiring at least a profit of 35.2, the difference there is actually just you know, money in the bank, there's money in our pockets, that is shareholder value being created. So we can add in a, a formula that's just a difference of these two things. Oops. Copy it over a couple cells and get the view um, at line of business level and at the portfolio level. So in this case, we're looking at line of business one and we're saying, we're getting, you know, we're, we're priced well here. We, we're planning for a loss ratio that's gonna generate more profit than we think we would require from, from this kind of uh, risk preference view through the, through the lens of this spectral risk measure. Line of business two falls on the other end and we're saying, you know, based on our quantification of risk associated with line of business two, we would actually require more premium than the plan is currently set up to bring in. And as a result, this is a, a detraction from shareholder value. Again, through this specific lens of spectral risk measures. As a whole, it brings the firm's, um, the shareholder value down into the negatives just because it's drug down uh, line of business one. And we're gonna come back to these kind of metrics and assessments through using a couple I think three in total, this is the first one, but we'll use three different distortion functions, all kind of based off of that um, pricing data, calibrated in different manners, and they'll give us different views. And it kind of stresses the point that, you know, the selection of that G is not an easy question, right? There's a lot of stuff that, that lives behind it. There's a lot of um, risk preference that, that's going on back there. So now the third one, uh, or sorry, the second, assessment that we're going to take a look at is in reinsurance. So reinsurance application would be, you know, you've gone out to market with this risk and you said, you know, I'm interested in what some reinsurance options might be, various reasons why companies buy reinsurance. Um, so you get some prices and right now we're wanting a, a way to assess those prices and say, do we think that's fair based on our view of this risk? Uh, a couple buttons in here are just to save some time. All they're doing is copying and pasting cells from above. Um, so right now we're looking at the, the 500 excess of 1500. Um, it's already entered in there, so I'm gonna go ahead and click store structure. It's gonna just bring down 
all the values of interest. So you can see these being calculated here. Uh, loss on line is just going to be my expected seeded loss over the limit. Uh, the maximum uh, rate on line is going to be my distorted expected seeded losses over the limit. So this is the, the seeded premium, my view of what seeded premium should be based on my quantification of the risk that's inherent in this. Um, and that is going to be, I think, just our, just, yeah, just our distorted expected seeded loss as the required premium. Um, so we're going to pretend we went out to the market and we got a quote of uh, 21% for uh, rate on line for that first structure. Going to enter a second structure here. So, so quick comparisons we could do. We could say 21%. Well, I said the maximum rate on line. So this is like my economic break-even point. This is where I think it's a fair deal. Well, if I think that I'd be willing to pay 24.4% rate on line, I get a quote from the market that's 21%. That's great, right? One structure. It beats my max. I would buy it. This is a good deal. It gets more complicated when you start to look at different structures. Um, and you have a number of different quotes. So let's now check the next layer. So we say rather than attaching at 1,500, we're going to attach at 2,000. We're going to see what that looks like. So 500 in excess of 2,000. I'm going to grab all the important values and store that structure down at the bottom. And the max rate online there was 8.8%. I'm going to pretend like I went out to the market and uh, we got a quote of uh, 10%. So we've got that quoted by the market at 10%. And you know, if that were in isolation, we would compare that to our max rate online and we'd say through this particular lens, uh, this is not a good deal. I'm only willing, I think that this risk would only be worth paying 8.8% rate online. You're trying to charge me 10. I don't think that adds value to my firm. Third structure, we're going to take those two stacked layers and look at them together. So it'll attach at 1500 and it'll now have a limit of a thousand. Same deal, we'll store the structure and pretend we went out there and got you know, a, a quote somewhere in the middle because we're really trying to assess both these together and get 15%. So 15% rate online um, beats our max rate online. So for looking at number three in isolation, we're saying, yeah, based on our view of this risk, the price we're getting from the market is going to add value to our firm. And the question then becomes, you know, well, now I've got two out of three that I think are good deals. Which one should, should I suggest or recommend to upper management or have, have further, um, a further look into? And so we can do that similar to how we looked at the line of business assessment. And we can just look at a difference, right? We can look at um, the required premium, what I would have been willing to pay to get rid of this risk, minus what the market's actually quoting me to, for that risk. And again, that's money in your pocket. This is firm value um, being generated, so shareholder value. And I can copy that over, and I get three different uh, shareholder value calculations, and I'd simply take the biggest one, right? Which one of these reinsurance deals puts the most money back into the firm? Which one um, has the biggest positive differential between what I'm saying I think that the risk uh, is worth and what the market's saying that they think the risk is worth. Obviously, there are you know, a thousand other business considerations for purchasing reinsurance, right? It's like you know, growth considerations, when the last time your reinsurance broker took you out to dinner, what kind of wine they bought, all, you know, a lot of, lot of stuff out there. But uh, from this particular lens, this gives you one view of how to kind of weigh your view of your risk against the, the market view of the risk. And with that, I think I will uh, turn it over to John. And with the uh, couple of minutes we have left, we'd love to entertain questions. I really love this, and um, I'm going to try to phrase this question in a way that doesn't sound like uh, snarky. So apologies for this, because trust me, I'm on your side. Um, like, I'm in no danger of becoming the chief risk officer or chief underwriting officer of an insurance company, and great. So I'm never going to be in the receiving end of the question that, that I think people who want to utilize this are going to be on. Uh, can you real quickly go back to the spreadsheet, if, if you could? Okay. I don't know. Can I? Can I? You would do it. Okay, cool. Yeah, and if you just like click over a little bit to, to the to the left when we looked at okay, okay, okay that, that, that's fine. So we we've got like um 
where was it? So yeah, we, okay. So we've got like cell E49. So we, we have uh, we have our um, uh, what, disruption function. Uh, uh, store store store. Excuse me, sir. Disruption function. Uh, so um, I, I'm presenting, and I said, so so with this function, with this uh, uh, risk measure, this uh, the, you know, this lovely coherent risk measure, um, it, having this target loss ratio uh, for these lines of business means that we're going to have an erosion of shareholder value of negative 4.7. Okay. Now I'm the chief risk officer, or the chief underwriting officer, or whatever. Okay, what tau would I need to get a shareholder value uh, that is neutral? Uh, you, you may be getting into this in part three. Um, but it, and also, like the points of using to uh, to calibrate this, like like in the market, there are just not that many. So, so uh, very unfair question. I apologize, but but I'm dying to know what, what you how you would respond. So uh, that's a great question, and it's got it's, and you can you know with this one this was calibrated to the piecewise linear, so there sort of isn't a tau. But if you're going to use one of the parametric ones, good old solver here will will back you into a tau. You can absolutely do that. And that actually is how, uh, for example, traders use black shells. Right? Traders don't use black shells to determine option prices. Traders use black shells to back out the volatility from the market price. Okay? So you can play the exact same game here. For example, if you're evaluating reinsurance structures, you can figure out, okay, what tau do I need to hit the market price? And it gives you a view of the, the sort of risk parameter, if you will, that the market is building into its different prices, and it gives you a way to rank, the re another way to rank the reinsurance uh, options that you're getting. So using it in reverse like that is, is actually sort of fairly common practice on the finance side, and we could do the same thing. So, so but in insurance, I mean, uh, which doesn't have that, that deep liquid traded uh, uh, set of data, uh, is it, is our only option, okay, uh, we've spoken to the reinsurance brokers, we got three quotes, um, or we're looking at, uh, whatever Aon has produced for, for like market studies, I mean, like, like the, the, the small sample size, or uh, is there some some mileage to be gained from saying, okay, look, we've looked at uh, the pricing of uh, bond default, you know, credit default, which is comparable. I mean, it does that fly? So, so Sean actually looked at that when he got to the, the paper that did the Wang T transform. I think it's called something like a universal framework for pricing risk. I mean, it was published in Aston Bulletin. And he was exactly trying to answer that question of, okay, can I come up with a consistent framework that prices both insurance risk, and he was looking at cap bonds for that, and bond defaults? And I, if I recall, he came up with the answer was yes, and T was between five and six, right? Was the, was the sort of long and short of that. So it does seem that there's some equivalence between uh, cap risk, at least, and uh, you know, bond risk. I think where it starts to get a little flakier is once you get into what we would all regard as clearly diversifiable risk, right? So you're doing sort of personal auto, high frequency, low severity, and you're outside of that left-hand range of where we've actually got data points, there it all becomes a bit trickier, and I think John's got a lot of stuff to say about that tomorrow, so I would encourage you to, uh, to attend the next session as well. Let me just add on that one. So um, one of our other colleagues from Guy Carpenter, Andreas Durek, who's a great actuary in Switzerland, works on a lot of very illiquid lines, like surety and aviation, and he's come up with an approach which I think is, a, is a, a great way to also think about this or the exercise you're you're talking about doing. And it's also framed a lot like the venture capital people that I'm increasingly seeing in the insure tech space, which is what do I need to believe in order for, ta -da, right? So what do you, your, your question I would frame as, what do we need to believe regarding our risk preference function, tau, piecewise, whatever, in order for the in order for the plan to be value neutral, because that's essentially what you're saying. Right. Whereas we we're 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 collecting enough profit per the risk we're taking on, right? What do I need to believe? And often you start from this point with let's say you know our our heavily calibrated market consistent preference function, and then if that number is minus 20, then you're going to need to believe either we're we're going to need a very different, we have to have a very different risk preference out of our investors than is represented by what we calibrated out of the market. May be true, right? You may have a very specialized group of investors, whatever. But just that approach, I think, is important. This whole exercise, um, it's important to recognize two things also. This is going to be highly iterative, 
and there is, uh, what's the behavioral finance one about uh, anchoring? There, there's a lot of anchoring around ROE, but ROE doesn't solve this either, right? Because, you, you know, let's say they go, like, well, you know, the plan is a, is a 12 ROE. Well, we're targeting a 15. That's no different than saying, you know, well, it's negative four and what's our preference for you? You're just, you're just kicking a different parametric can around, in my view. I do want to point out one thing that Jesse skipped over that's one of the real, that's an amazing property of this that may encourage you to take a further look. So, does everybody know what those three numbers are? That's the, cal that's the premium he calculated for the 500X 1500, and then the 500X 2000, and then the 1000X 1500. That plus that equals that. That's really hard to do with allocated capital, or we're going to use DVAR or whatever, or VAR, or a correlation, this or that, or marginal, Rodney Kreps, or you name it. I mean, you, you try to do that, good luck. And this was the original, when was Gary Venter's original paper where he introduced this? Like, 1990, early 90s? Nine, yeah, 90s. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and he, Gary Venter wrote on this, prop, on this property as being one of the really compelling ones, because in his argument, otherwise, you do get, this is an illiquid market, but you would, it would introduce arbitrage, right, possibility. If you don't have this ability in the extreme being that we could do dollar slices like Steve said, if you don't have this ability, then arguably it exists. Other questions? Anything else? And just as a note, tomorrow we will see that ROE does have, targeted ROE does have a role to play in calibration. Minor role, but an important one. It's a bit player. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you.